be aggressive, you've got to work up, I hate for the batsman, not in person, but for the fact that you've got to get him out. You've got to try and outthink the batsman, you've got to try and think what he's thinking, and then outthink him again. If in fact you have to scare him out, well, you try that too. about fast bowlers in Australia, it was Dennis Lilly. Um, no ifs, no buts, no maybes. Dennis was the man. The best fast bowler the world's ever seen. Dennis is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. People say to me, of all the bowlers you play against, who had the best action? Probably Dennis Lilly. Who had the most skill? Probably Dennis Lilly. It was just this burning desire to get the batsman out. You know, his aggression, his use of the piece, his use of the ball. When he was bowling, the whole game lifted. The crowd got involved. The crowd is chanting, Lee, 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 Lee. It was just pure genius. Lily had great pizzazz. He used to have his shirt open all the way down, this big airy chest. Big mo, big hair. Long sleeve shirt flapping in the breeze. Swipe the, the finger across the forehead and flick the sweat off. It's all, all part of it, isn't it? There's no doubt in my mind that Dennis was the yardstick which all the others judged themselves by. He was the great Dennis Roy, the great man, simple as that. Jenna facing Underwood. And that's it. Is it? Yes, he's out. That's the end of the match. In 1971, Ray Illingworth's England team won the Ashes for the first time in 15 years. A devastating defeat for Australia on home soil, but one that offered a glimmer of hope. For by the time the two sides met in the fifth test in Adelaide, Australia felt ready to unleash a 21-year-old fast bowler from Perth by the name of Dennis Keith Lilly. Australia has always placed great stress on fast bowling, dramatic, histrionic, aggressive fast bowling, but you forget just how rare um, these individuals are. He was getting wickets in the shield and doing quite well, and um, I think they might have just been looking for a fast bowler. Um, because some of the other bowlers, I think, were getting uh, just to the end of their careers at that stage. I'd seen him play for um, Western Australia, and uh, I remember talking to Frank Tyson, and uh, I said to Frank, well, if I was an Australian selector now, I would pick uh, Dennis Lilly straight away. Dennis burst onto the scene in the Adelaide Test match in 70-71. The wicket in Adelaide is pretty much a, a batsman's paradise. He came in like the young colt, arms and legs all over the place and bowled quick. For a bowler to get the ball moving on that surface, you knew somebody pretty special had arrived. He was aggressive, which hadn't been the case for quite some time. You know, he was quite prepared to, to get into blokes. He had something about him that he wasn't just a young tearaway quick bowler, that from a lively pace, he was still swinging the ball. Hold him. He was the greatest bowler that I've ever seen. You know, even as a youngster, you knew there was something there, even with his wild and woolly action. When he got it all together, he bowled fast outswingers. And anyone that can bowl fast outswingers got a real chance. He came in against us at Adelaide and got five for straight away and turned out to be a great bowler. Someone playing in their first test match <laughs> puts in a little bit extra, don't they? And uh, Dennis certainly done that. With five wickets in his first innings in Test cricket, it was clear that Australia had unearthed a new star. However, few gave Lilly and his young Australian teammates a chance as they attempted to regain the Ashes in England the following year. I can remember it being said that we were the most inexperienced Australian side that's ever been to England. We had a lot of players who had played less than 10 Tests, and um, I think four players made the debut in that series. I'm far from well equipped in any of the any of the um, essentials, I think, at the moment. I, I'm still learning a lot. He may have been raw, but eight wickets in the first test proved Lily was more than just a fleeting talent.
watched Lily bowling in 1972 and it's just almost impossible to imagine fast bowling as exciting and as exhilarating. He was yards faster than all the other cricketers around at the time. At the moment, the accent seems to be on speed. I can't bowl defensively. I haven't learnt it and I don't hope to learn it. It was very intimidating and he wasn't, he wasn't frightened to let you know he was there. It's just this magnificent, crazy, theatrical, over-the-top, bravura performance. I'm trying something every ball. I, I, I try and get the batsman out just about every ball, which is what a lot of people have told me is the wrong way of going about it. He was the dominant player of the series. It was a great performance from a young guy, and uh, it just underlined the fact that, you know, what he was going to become. A further 23 wickets in the series heralded Dennis Lilly as the most hostile fast bowler in the game. It seemed nothing could hold him back. Physically, I'm not really strong, I don't think. Because of his action, which was very loose, he hurt his back very early. The whole of that 1972 tour, he was under treatment. Serious treatment. You don't know I could be finished in a year and no one will ever think of me again. Well, he breaks down very early in his career and spends a season out of the game in 1973-4 and has to rebuild himself from the ground up. This was probably the first fast bowler who had ever broken down with a stress fracture. It was fractured in four places and I could do virtually no action resembling a bowling action at all. Uh, without intense pains flying up and down my back. After they discovered the um, stress fractures and he had a season off, he spent one winter learning how to run. I mean, even the players today, they, they wouldn't do as much as what Dennis did as far as the running. For fitness, for technique and for mental skills, I used to give the players a mark out of 10. Lily was the only player I ever gave 10 out of 10 for each of those three categories. I started to move into slow bowling and gradually built up when I bowled very, very slowly, I can assure you. He learned to slow down things and he was very interested in his technique and he refined everything. When he came back from that, he became a better bowler because he worked out different ways of getting people out. He still has all the moves, but he has massively expanded his repertoire. He's hugely increased his guile. Uh, he is the master of, of every mental uh, lure and, and trick, and he's still the most dramatic fast bowler around. By November 1974, and with England again in town, Lily was back, and this time he had a new partner in attack, Jeff Thompson. The 74-5 uh, series without helmets was probably the most terrifying experience that England have ever been through. Lily had had a crippling back injury and Jeff Thompson was just considered this sort of beach bum who'd been dredged up by Queensland to play a few games. We knew how quick Tomo was and of course the Poms didn't because they'd not heard of Tomo or they'd not taken those and they were more concerned about Lily. As it turned out, uh, they are the most formidable, formidable pairing that uh, the Aussies had ever put together. Nasty delivery. Well, that was lethal. When, when Tomo arrived on the scene, I felt very sorry for a lot of opposition batsmen, I can tell you. Nasty one, he could be out here. That he is. Terrifying. I'm glad I was, I mean, it was, I used to field in the covers and I was scared for the palms in the covers. I think that a lot of them would have rather been somewhere else. We remember there's no helmets in those days either. And when I look at it now on, on, on film, the ball was flying around all over the place. You just wonder, how did we do it without, uh, without helmets? Helmets, arm guard, chest pads, a bit of a protector, a box, a cricketer's box. Not adequate. Thompson to Lloyd. And hit badly there that time. It's a nasty one. I think it was David Lloyd who just uh, um, looked at me from the other end as the non-striker and was saying, oh, we've got, we've got our hands full here. Oh. 
nasty delivery. What a combination with Thompson at you all the time. You're thinking, he's going to hurt me, this guy, and Lily going boom, 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 and aggressive with it as well and making you play. He's been brought back magnificently. I play the game extremely hard on the field, and I believe that's the only way to play it. I think Lily, at, at that stage, still would have perceived himself and was perceived as the leader of the attack. And Daisy Court has played match goals. I don't like seeing a, a person permanently damaged or maimed or anything like that. But if he gets in the way, that's his fault, unfortunately. They all have aggression, but Dennis had this great line that he bowled. He bowled. He could make it talk. He could swing the ball late in the air and get it seeming off pitches where nobody else could get the ball to move. It was his ability to move the ball as much as bowl fast that intimidated the batsman. Between them, Lillian Thompson took 58 wickets in a crushing 4-1 victory. The effect on England in that tour was shattering. I mean, the batsmen all shattered. You could see when they came out to play. I mean, they just didn't want to be there. Don't blame them. I'm glad I was on our side. The most exciting thing is to play when you've got really fast bowlers in your side. That's really exciting. <laughs> Lily took a further 21 wickets to help retain the Ashes in England later that summer. His comeback from injury was complete. What can I say about Dennis Lilly? The guy completely rewrote the fast bowling coaching manual. He was special, no doubt about that. He was one of the great cricket thinkers of all time. He provides a blueprint that I think all subsequent fast bowlers have had to follow, whether they've known it or not. It was a guide that the West Indies would ultimately learn from following their tour to Australia in 1975-76. Fast bowling becomes the way to win matches and Lillian Thompson becomes the template for success in the future. Yeah! You go to Australia, you're gonna meet um, the best fast bowlers and most aggressive fast bowlers in the world. The pace of Lillian Thompson unsettled uh, the West Indies then, as it had unsettled England the year before. It doesn't matter how well you think you'll conquer Dennis. You know, there's always something that comes up unexpected. He was a magnificent fast bowler. Dennis Lilly is probably the greatest fast bowler you know, that we've ever had. We went to Australia and they were just totally brutal. We lost 5-1, I guess. Seeing the way that Tomo and Lily bowled probably gave them a few plans as well, that not everyone likes a ball around about rib height. It was like the, they were hardened in, the, in the, the fire of defeat. And that's what the beginning of the Great West Indies side was. But with Lily in attack, Australia went from strength to strength. In 1977, he produced arguably his finest form in the centenary test against England in Melbourne. His 11 wickets in the match, the decisive factor in Australia's win. His best performances were on the flattest wickets that were possible to play on. The centenary test is a prime example of that. Sometimes you couldn't scare him out on flat tracks. You had to think about a little bit more and work players out a little bit more. I think some of us thought this would be a sort of glorified exhibition match, but we knew straight away when we arrived in Melbourne it was anything but. Dennis kept going fantastically. And although Derek Randall was given the man of the match for his dramatic 170, the real man of the centenary test was Dennis Lilly. By the mid-70s, led by the firepower of Lillian Thompson, the batting genius of Greg and Ian Chappell, and the wicket-keeping of Rod Marsh, Australia were the team to beat. There was certainly no better side to play in than that side during the 70s. That Australian team in the 1970s is this very close-knit band of brothers, loyal, fundamentally to themselves and, and to no one else. <laughs> Too far back. We were arrogant, no doubt about that. And because of that, people hated us. 
Here we are, I think I've done all those. 450 boomerangs, 350 bats, 125 books. And that accounts for this morning's work. But we were arrogant because I suppose we had a cause to be arrogant uh, because we kept on beating everyone. Mr Thompson was bowling very fast, very often. When the ball hit Colin, it hurt. Ouch! <laughs> Felt as though we were invincible. Uh, we couldn't be beaten. I don't think anyone walked out there expecting not to win. That was um, largely due to Lily and Tomo. But in May 1977, Australian cricket was torn apart. Media mogul Kerry Packer sensed players' frustrations with the game's administrators and formed a breakaway competition that lured the world's best cricketers, World Series Cricket. In a sense, Lily's predicament as a cricketer in the 1970s is what World Series Cricket is all about. It's because of people like the Two Chapels, Doug Walters, Dennis particularly, were sitting there seeing all these crowds full and we were getting $200 a test match. They couldn't figure out where all this money was going. It's virtually a semi-professional type of game. Playing cricket alone is just not good enough, especially if you've got a family. He is among the first signatories to World Series cricket because he feels so strongly about the way in which the game failed to look after him in the early 70s. From a monetary point of view, World Series cricket uh, had to happen. It did happen, and I think the game's been better for it. It was a start in the right direction. Coloured gear, night cricket, coloured balls, the whole thing. I shuddered to think where the game had been now if it hadn't have been for World Series cricket. In his two years and 14 super tests in World Series cricket, Dennis Lilly took 67 wickets. None would count in his overall career statistics, however. If it wasn't for World Series cricket, where that became unofficial tests uh, that they played in, in which he got 70 odd test wickets, I'm sure he would have been the first to cross the 400 wicket mark. In 1979, the two forms of the game reunited and Dennis Lilly was back playing test cricket for Australia. Now one of the veterans of a young and promising team. He was just one of those guys that just dragged you along. Just his, his personality and, and his performance level, he just dragged everyone along with him. And uh, so it was great to be part of that, particularly as a young player. with a wicket there in the most emphatic fashion. Yeah, he just led the attack and while he was playing, you know, you just never out of the game. Despite his experience, Lilly was becoming increasingly hot-headed. In December 1979, it was his batting that made headlines, becoming the first player in cricket to use an aluminium bat. Dennis was completely stupid with this aluminium bat. Could not hit the thing out of the net. It was absolutely pathetic, useless. Absolute shocker, but we didn't tell Dennis that. <laughs> it was taking great chunks out of the cricket ball. Mike really certainly got Dennis's back up uh, when he said uh, that he shouldn't be using the aluminium bat. Dennis walks off the ground, he comes in, and Greg says, What's the problem, Dennis? He said, Oh, they. No, 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 no. <laughs> Told me I've got to change bats. So he, he, he grabbed a bat. And as he walked out the door, Rod Marsh, his great mate, said, Dennis, you're not going to let the Poms tell you what to do, are you? <laughs> and with that, Dennis then grabbed back the aluminium bat and stormed down the stairs and walked out again with the aluminium bat. I thought it was all hilarious. Greg then picked up three wooden bats, had to trail after him like a little kid, say, Dennis, give me the blinking aluminium bat here and take one of the wooden ones. Dennis hurled it across the field and replaced it with a, a traditional wooden one in the end. That sums up Dennis. Uh, it could only happen with DKL. Probably that and trying to kick Javid me and Dad up the backside were low points of Dennis's career. We had that infamous Dennis Lilly Javid run in at the, the Wacker. He's raced up, touched down at Dennis's end. We've looked up to see Dennis, you know, with his boot out there, and we're thinking, what the dickens went on there? If I live longer than Dennis and he's on his deathbed and I ask him the question, did he actually ram the bat into your uh, ribs? I, I think he'll have to say no, because I sure as hell don't reckon he did. Lily had the one factor that a lot of others didn't have, and that was that fear factor in his approach. He was just such a blanket competitor. I mean, he'd bowl to his mother and not bowl to too many half volleys, I'm sure. 
that look on his face. Oh, I'd hate to be a batsman against him. Every time I bat in the nets, Dennis wanted to bowl here. He'd be warming up in the nets before the game. Kim Hughes would come into the nets. He'd grab a new ball, go off the full run. Pew, 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 pew. This particular day, Dennis was screaming in. The ball's whistled past there, no helmet. 55 kilos ring and wet, five pad about that, the old pink plastic protector, the green pimple gloves. So I'm going, Jesus. <laughs> and Kim would just pick up the ball, throw it back, and bowl Dennis. Sometimes you can just sort of feel it touch your hair. And he said, sorry. And I thought he meant it. And as he got down nice and close, he said, sorry, missed your head, you curly headed. <laughs> so that was my introduction to Dennis Lilly. That fiery relationship continued when Kim Hughes assumed the captaincy. At times, Lily was unmanageable. There were some days where Dennis wanted 25 on the field, and the, the thing was not to argue with him. So the deal was that if anybody could have Dennis's ear, it would be Rod. The thing about my relationship with Dennis was, I mean, I watched him very closely, and I batted against him in the nets a lot. He tried to kill me in the nets on many an occasion, but I reckon I knew what he was going to do before he did it. Court Marsh bowled Lily became one of the most often repeated statistics in cricket. Between them, the pair from Perth accounted for 95 test wickets, the most successful bowler fielder combination in cricket history. And as Lily entered the twilight of his career in the early 80s, his fire remained undimmed. For while Dennis Lily was bowling, Australia was still a formidable force in the game. I'd been with him since about 1970, so you know, I didn't see any difference, except that you know, he wasn't the out-and-out -out fast bowler that he was. He was a um, wily old character at the end, still taking wickets with the leg cutters and things, and those little edges just carrying through to Rod Marsh. The records continue to tumble. His 10 wickets against the West Indies in December 1981 saw him overtake Lance Gibbs as the highest test wicket taker of all time. But at the beginning of 1984, Lily called time on his glorious career. Fittingly, in his last match against Pakistan, he took eight wickets. I think he could have played on for another few years easily, even though he didn't have the, the blinding pace that he had in his younger days. Physically, I could play for another three or four years. Um, mentally, I'm not quite sure that I could, and uh, probably mentally more than anything else. Uh, um, I realise that uh, it's very hard to keep setting goals and to keep pushing yourself um, in a situation where you've been playing um, top sport for uh, 14 years. He just kept running in, kept trying. And he got 355 test wickets at about 21, 22 apiece. Absolutely outstanding. Dennis, to me, he's the greatest fast bowler that I've ever seen, without doubt. I wish the younger players could have seen him like, like I saw him. He still casts this incredibly long shadow of, over Australian cricket. If you go up to the MCG and have a look at that Dennis Dilley statue, you can be approaching from 100 metres away and you can see the silhouette and you know that is Dennis Dilley. It's not just Dennis and his technique, it's the influence he had on people. Oh, he's bowling! What a beautiful ball that by Dennis Dilley. He said to us when I was, when I was 16, he, there was a whole heap of us at a clinic down here, he goes, boys, boys, come in here, I'll tell you the three secrets of success. And we're going, oh yeah, Dennis Lilly, the three secrets of success, what are they? He goes, the first secret, you got to work hard. We're going, oh, right. Dennis Lilly, for me, was my role model. I'd learnt uh, off Dennis Lilly in the backyard, you know, we used to watch him on TV. I was Dennis Lilly with my brother John in the backyard, and it would be Jeff Thompson coming in and slinging the balls. Second secret, come a bit closer, I'll tell you. You've got to work hard. When I speak to the other quicks in the team at the same time, I think Dennis Lilly was, was their hero as well. And yeah, we call ourselves the fast bowling cartel, FBC. And when we see each other, that's the secret. So it's the, the cross is the forward and flick it like Dennis did. So the legend lives on. Anyone know what the third secret? You've got to work hard. You're bloody right. You've got to work hard. If you don't work hard, you won't be any good. And that's what Dennis Lilly, and he's been the same ever since. 